Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Donaghy, and I'm the education curator at the Wingate Museum of Art at Hendricks College. Thank you for joining us for this evening's artist talk with Katrina Andre. The exhibition Katrina Andre, The Promise of the Rainbow Never Came is on view in the Wilcox Todd Gallery through March 12th. Please visit and bookmark the museum's website at wingatemuseum.org. There you'll find information about all of our spring exhibitions, planning a visit to the museum and other virtual programs, including a conversation coming up on February 15th with Courtney Taylor, who curated this exhibition. While we are hosting this evening's program virtually, we want to acknowledge that the Wingate Museum of Art at Hendricks College occupies the traditional homelands of the Osage, Quapaw, and Caddo. We offer respect and gratitude to the indigenous peoples who have cared for the land over generations. We ask that you please keep your microphone muted to avoid distraction or disruption. If you have any questions during the program, please type them in the chat box and we will address them at the end of the program. We are honored to have Katrina Andre with us this evening. Katrina holds a Master of Fine Arts in Printmaking from Louisiana State University. She lives in and maintains a studio in New Orleans. Most recently, Katrina was one of seven artists included in the New Orleans Museum of Arts Changing Course Reflections on New Orleans Histories, an exhibition reconsidering New Orleans upon the city's tricentennial. She was listed in the January February 2012 issue of Art in Print as one of the top 50 printmakers. She has also been awarded many residencies including from the Joan Mitchell Center of New Orleans, Anchor Graphics in Chicago, and the Kala Institute in Berkeley, California. This year, Andrea is one of the 52 international artists invited to exhibit in Prospect 5 in New Orleans, a citywide art triennial, as well as in an upcoming exhibition at the Katona Museum in upstate New York. We are also pleased to be joined by two members of the Hendricks College faculty this evening, Tony Waljadon and Melissa Gill. Tony is an associate professor of English. She teaches courses in US literatures and cultures. Melissa is in her 13th year as a professor of printmaking and drawing. Her own work as an artist focuses on multimedia printmaking, dyeing, and stitching on fabric to create objects that represent a transformation from the commonplace to the extraordinary. And on that note, I will ask Melissa to get us started, one artist to another. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks everyone for uh, coming to this artist talk. We're super excited to get to know Katrina a little bit more and hear her uh, talk about her work um, and the show that we have currently at the museum. Um, and so I was tasked with asking the very first question to, to start us off. And because I'm a printmaker, I'm going to ask you, uh, Katrina, um, to talk a little bit to us about your process. Um, I noticed that your prints um, use several different techniques, combining relief and digital, and then you have some sort of, maybe you could call it collage or application on the top. Um, so what, you know, I'm sure you're going to tell us a lot more about this. So could you tell us a little bit about your technical processes um, that you use to work for the show? Yes, thanks, Melissa. Um, yes, I would love to tackle that question. It is a very popular question. I think printmaking, as I'm sure you know, Melissa, is like a mystery to a lot of people. They want to know what is it? What is this magic? Is it a copy? Like, no, it's an original. They're all originals. Um, and the method that I use for this exhibition, I use a combination of relief printing, of color reduction relief and multi block relief. Color reduction relief is when you only have one block and you carve away the negative space, you print your first color, and then you carve that color away, 
and then you print your second color and you keep doing that until you get to what's called the key line, which is your last color. It's usually the outline that you use for your, um, for your prints. And I register all of my prints to be using just like a T registration at the top, mainly because my prints are really large. The, um, for y'all that have been to the museum, y'all have noticed they're all about like, uh, like uh, four feet by five feet in size. Um, and I, I make them large purposefully to just to they command attention. Um, they use, I use bright vivid colors to also command attention. Um, the water layer, for the prints that are at the museum are the multi-block. I wanted this like almost veiled look to the eel in the water. Um, and, but to keep it from on top so that it was, so that you could see the transformation happening as the person entered the water. And the digital background, I've done that before. I did that with another series I started in grad school where I, I created these quilts and then I digitally printed them onto the paper and then printed with woodblock on top of that. And I did that for some of the prints that are in the exhibition as well. Some of them have a cloud background that you notice is digital. Um, and some of them, the clouds are carved. Um, and that's just how I worked with this series. And then the collage aspect is the, um, the rainbow drops that are on top, the raindrops that are on top that are like a rainbow iridescent. I'm going to show them in the slideshow. It's kind of hard. It's hard to see in a photo that how just shiny and rainbow -y they are. Um, but I'm going to start this slideshow too, just so that y'all have a sense of what I'm talking about for people who haven't been. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to see. Wish me luck. Everybody cross their fingers. <gasps> Thank you. This is one of the prints that's in, in the exhibition at the Wingate. Um, all of the prints are called The Promise of the Rainbow Never Came. And furthermore, when I, when I create these prints, um, so I start out with like a sketch or idea, I do some research of what I, what I wanna do just so that I can get everything that I want sort of in one piece. It really helps if I do a, a word web that's what they called it when I was in school. Um, it's basically when you take one word, like take the word phone, and then you stream of conscious, write down all the words you associate with phone, phone, call, call, mom, mom, home, home. And you just keep doing that over and over again with that word phone. And that really helps me to create the symbolism that I'm going to use in my prints. Um, so I do that. And then I, I ask usually my poor sisters, and my poor husband to model for me. And then, and then I create a collage in Photoshop and that really helps me to start. And then I just draw straight from that collage into a large piece, piece of birch. And then I, um, with Sumi ink, and then I shellac that piece of birch, scrape the grain down. And I do that a couple of times. This really helps if you're gonna carve on wood so that you don't, um, so that your edges aren't rough so that you can carve it. It carves very easily, especially if your tools are sharp. Um, it just really helps it if you knock the grain down. Um, and then I do the reductive print on top and I usually use um, archival cotton paper to do that by Linux. So that's my process, Melissa. Did I leave anything out that you were curious about? Um, no, no. Please continue. <laughs> I have a lot more questions, but I think um, I'll save them for the end. Okay. Um, so I'm going to jump from my process to describing what these prints are. Um, so the promise of the rainbow never came are prints about people lost during the Middle Passage, um, transatlantic slave trade. And so Sorry, I have notes that I'm gonna follow, but I'm not gonna read from because who likes that? Um, and so yeah, so they're turning into eels and the eels are kind of this own mythology that I created. And it's not really like, um, a lot of people in the past have asked like, are the eels an escape from, from enslavement? Are they like sort of this Afrofuturistic view of, of black people turning into 
water creatures and then having this sort of life away from people underwater. Um, for me, they're, they are not there. This is, this, this is people turning into eels, transforming into eels. And it's connected to another series that I'll get into just a little bit. But I had them turn into eels. I was watching and the inspiration for eels really came. I was watching this PBS documentary about eels. And if I can remember the name, I'd tell y'all, but I don't remember. And they were talking about how eels raised in Maine or are sold you know, in Asia. Um, and how just like before they didn't even recognize it as a market because people here don't, we know we avoid eels, they're electric, we don't like them, they look like snakes, we don't eat them like they do in other places. And I was sitting there watching it with, with my husband who is from Okinawa, and he was just, his mind was blown. He was like, what, the eels? Like eels are delicious, eels are cute, what is happening? Um, we also don't know very much about eels. We don't know where they spawn, we don't know how they spawn, we don't know um, where they gather. And so I don't know if it's out of a lack of curiosity or just that eels are so elusive in that way that we don't know much about eels. And so I thought that eels were an appropriate animal to have them transform into. Um, oops, sorry. For this series. And this series I have, I can't figure out how to do the um, slideshow, so I'm just going to press. But the series that I had is connected to another series um, that I did, that I worked on at the same time. Oh, y'all. And this is from Depose and Dispose Of. Um, also done, you know, I did this before the migration series. And this, rather than having people turn into an animal, it's just a half, half human, half animal. And this really speak, or what I was calling like not quite human, and it really speaks to, I wanted to tie in what black people are called um, slurs used for black people. So, you know, stallion, bull, barracuda, um, raccoon, gorilla, bear, and how using animal words to describe a human can strip someone of their humanity, like the consequences of, of, of using dehumanizing language to describe a person and tying this, this, um, this present tense use of language to describe black people to the past treatment of black people, which is why the people are turning into eels um, in the other series. And that, but that being the connection. And then the, the iridescent drops on top, these raindrops, it also connects in that way. So you have this from enslavement to, um, to the, you know, present day, so past civil rights act, when, you know, which is when it's really when America as a country uh, practiced democracy fully, um, wasn't until the 60s, is, is this promise unfulfilled? Is this, is this, is this, this, is connection to Noah's Ark, you know, the rainbow, I will never flood the world again. While my raindrops don't connect to water, it is, you know, this promise of freedom and this promise of a life, um, of a humanely, tr being humanely treated life, and that promise unfulfilled. Um, hence the name of the, the series and also the use of the mylar, the iridescent mylar on top. And so then people some will then usually ask, well, how many people were really lost during the Middle Passage? And who was lost during the Middle Passage? Who were these people? Um, and that's, no. Um, and and that's, that, a bit of that is a little bit unknown. They estimate anywhere between two and 14 million people were lost during the Middle Passage. This does not include the time period where people were waiting to embark. Um, people were often trapped or, or captured by Africans in the country and then sold to European captors to, to go to the Americas. And as that happens, they kept them in fortresses for sometimes up to a year. It was normally about half a year that they were kept um, in captivity and before they, before they went on a two to three week voyage um, to the Americas. And during that time period, it's mainly men that were captured. Families were often were also often captured together. So there were men, women, and children, which is why they're represented in the prints as well. 
um, the, uh, in a ship would make up from anywhere between 50% men and then 50% women and children. Um, and a lot of a lot of people that were captured died before they ever took the voyage, but they're not counted in the um, in the two to 14 million number. Um, that they just aren't. And anywhere between five and 20% of a ship's cargo, what they called it, were, was lost. And that was, there were usually 600 people about on a ship, um, sometimes as high as 50% um, of, of the ship's cargo was lost. And the other question that, that happens is, well, how did people die? And so then that leads also to the transformation into the eels. And people often died of dehydration, dysentery, ophthalmalia, um, fevers, and, and sicknesses unknown to them before encountering the Europeans. And what was curious about, about that is that the Europeans had a, had a name for it that called fixed melancholy. And I thought that was really interesting when I was doing research because the idea of fixed melancholy or bonzo is that pe the people on the ship brought it on themselves. And so then a lot of the times whenever, not a lot of times, oftentimes, when people died on the ship, and mainly the men below deck were susceptible um, to dying of disease because they were packed very tightly below deck where women and children were above deck. Were above deck. Um, they, because they had, they, they felt that the sickness was brought on by the kidnapped people themselves, they would, before they would throw them overboard, they would often dismember them to discourage other captives from bringing on the same sickness that killed, you know, the person that they just threw overboard. About also, you know, people died because about one in 10 um, ships, there was a revolt on the ship. Most of the revolts happened before people got on the ship, but p mutineers were punished severely, often dismembered and then thrown, thrown overboard to discourage other people from um, from revolting as well. There weren't very many successful revolts because as you can imagine, like if you have a ship and you have a person that stands up really high on a ship, you know, I forget what that part of the ship is called. They have a good vantage point of the whole ship. So there weren't a whole lot of those. Um, and then people might, you know, like, well, what did they do on the, on the ship also too? Now, how long was the voyage? The voyage was about two to three weeks. And that was, that was the typical voyage to the Americas, um, to the Americas here. I didn't want to, I, I did, to add to, 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 make, to make sure the figures um, humanity was maintained. I didn't want to create figures that were dismembered turning into um, eels. Um, I want it to be to capture their vulnerability, um, capture their humanity, and capture their story um, more so than um, you know than than the, the goriness of it actually. And then another another so I was curious like a lot of people are curious well did because you hear that you hear like did sharks change their migration patterns because of this? Um, there's actually no evidence that that happened. There is, the evidence is that sharks followed these ships um, to a certain degree and then other sharks picked up and then other sharks picked up. But as far as changing their migration patterns, that didn't really happen. Um, and that's a little history about the middle passage. Um, so, that work, it was really like some books and some research on JSTAR. Um, that book stemmed from the beginning really inf helped influence this work as well. Um, I'm sure y'all have heard Ibram Kendi's name like a million times by now. Yeah, he, that's his first book that he wrote. It's very good. It, it really helps to tie the past to the present. Um, you know, he mainly talks about like laws and prejudices and treatments, but. But yeah, I flew right through that. I talked very fast. That leaves a lot of, a lot of room for questions. 
I feel like I maybe left if I if yeah, it leaves room for questions. There's some people, there's some activity on the chat. Um, is it okay if I ask a question from the chat? Yeah. <laughs> so um, the first one I see is um, the postures of the figures in your prints are compelling, active positions that are somehow static as they delve into the water. When was the figure entered into the process among the many registrations you made for each print? Um, good question. So right away. So this print that we're looking at right now, the digital aspect of it is, is first, is printed first. And then everything, so the eel and the bodies are printed together. Because some of the eels are separated out, um, not connected, you know, I might print them at the same time using different colors. But overall, they're, they're printed together. And yet I really wanted it to almost for the bodies to look shocked, looked vulnerable, um, not look like they were in any sort of anticipation, um, but more, yeah, more shocked and vulnerable. I think that that for me really helped. Like I said, I keep going back to humanity. That really helped for me to to try to put their humanity on display. I wanted to ask a question if I could. Um, I'm super interested in the, the way that these prints um, intersect with and rework our understanding of the Middle Passage as a historical phenomenon. And so I'm curious if you would say a little bit about um, maybe your own process of, you know, not just looking at these historical materials, but then thinking about crafting a response, right, that does justice to the humanity of the people who went overboard against, you know, this whole process, this historical process that was dedicated to, you know, removing that kind of dignity that you're working to restore. Yeah, sure. So I think that for, um, for me, it was it's it's hard to say you know i know a lot of the art is represented by show by picturing the people tightly packed right in ships and just how you know the act of the the activity of the um of the middle passage um this piece is a little a little missing that i found personally and not my research but um just in how people, how it was represented and it being represented at all, um, people being thrown overboard during the voyage. Um, so, you know, it, that compelled me to want to, to create a piece like that, to create a pe uh, exhibition um, or series of this work, but also to just my research, like the records that were kept were just like so bizarre to me. There were, it was, it was, you know, they would bring doctors on board. Do they want to know what's going on? Why are people dying? They they named it something to, that removed the blame from themselves. Like, oh, we don't know these strange people are are dying in this way. They bring it on themselves because they miss they miss their homeland so much. Or you know, they were there was all sorts of debate. It it even entered the debate for why um why why it shouldn't exist anymore. The transatlantic slave trade. You know, this idea that that idea of fixed melancholy enters the debate in a way that like well it should continue because like we're not they're they're just strange and they're bringing it on themselves we don't know what's going on like i don't know so you know that really that um i wouldn't say it fascinated me but it was i was like wow really? <laughs> let me just let me bring humanity back into this you know this idea that people would bring this on themselves is nuts And it goes, you know, present day, you can, you can argue that with like people trying to figure out like what's going on in, you know, in these communities. Well, is it this problem? Is it this problem? Is it... But when you, if you, you know, it doesn't take very much research. You know, I would recommend the book, The Color of Law and another book, The Color of Wealth. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't take very much digging 
um, looking at legislation to know why why these things are happening. But you know, victim blaming is something past and present. So I can go ahead and keep reading from the chat or we can have people unmute themselves to ask questions. I'm going to go ahead and unmute myself because I have to dip kind of early, but I did also put it in the chat um, if that's cool. I mentioned that I found it really interesting that there were like um, eels already present in the water. like as these victims were like transforming into eels. And so I was curious as to like what your goal was in making those and like what their presence was. Are these eels, are these victims? Yeah. Make it yeah. I mean, the, the, the whole, the origin of eels um, is my, it's, is my own mythology like the, of the, these, this is how we got eels, right? Um, so yeah, whether they're past there are people who have made that voyage before and were thrown overboard um, that, or were thrown overboard around the same time is, is them, you know, are them. Uh, I, I guess I'll ask a question. Um, I got a question. Well, first of all, I saw your show just uh, the other day. And I was really struck by the raindrop slash tears, the way they, the way they moved with the cut, the you know, as you moved around the room, they really sort of come to life in a way that you, you can't see here. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. And my question is about about th that aspect of the images in particular. I sort of get the feeling that every choice that you make has has sort of a a visual reason, and like a story slash symbol reason. So my question is, you know. If you if you think like that, you know what are the what are the sort of two categories of reasons like that that you might have for why you did that, what it means, and what it means about how it looks, and um, so why did you use that material, I guess, for that image for those images? Well, for that, thank you for the question. Um, I for so it it goes back to the word web. Actually, I was I was I had the word promise. Um, you know the word the word promise led to this word rainbow and using that material i always try to so i also found it a little i also find it striking especially in a series that like when that material is used and i've used it in some other some other works too that it does catch your eye whether you're looking at it or not um and i use a lot of colors in that way too lime green pops up a lot in my other works um that's a col another color that catches your eye and so the eye-catching techniques, but yeah, like eye-catching techniques, it's, it, it's just the way to command someone's attention. Um, you know, the rainbow connection to pr a promise unfulfilled by, by the society that we live in um, and what that has meant to, to society as a whole, but especially um, to a group of people. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it does. I think maybe you you cut out a little bit in the middle of my question. I think you were talking about radio earlier in your presentation. I think you might have cut out then, so I missed that part. Um, what exactly is that stuff, that material? It's mylar. So it's, um, I get it from, there's like one shop in New York that I found, a rock chest in New York that I found that, that makes, that sells it. But it's just this, let me see if I have one. It's just this like iridescent mylar. You can also get it from this shop called um, Canal Acrylic uh -huh. out of New York and play with it. And it, it comes with like a, um, a tacky back, but I found that it really helps if you mount it using photo mount for it not to, you know, so that you can manipulate the paper better. Yeah, so you didn't run it through a press? You didn't like shinkole it on? Nope. It's too oh. thick to, it's kind of too thick to do that. And I did, yeah, I didn't know how that would, um, how that would take. I scraped it with, you know, I just kind of squeegeed it or scraped it with the, 
with a an ink palette knife. Thank you. Yeah. Katrina, I'll jump in with a couple of questions from the chat. Um, folks are wondering uh, how long it takes you to make each print. Um, and do you typically do such large scale work? Um, yes, I, um, I do typically do large scale. I'm now I've, I've just tried to make a work that's like 32 by 32 and I'm struggling y'all. But, um, but yeah, I, I, yeah. And it normally takes me so, you know, the research and reading and, and word webbing and writing and might take a few months. Um, but then making the actual work, once I get to the, that, that point where I'm ready to make the work, I feel really confident about what I'm going to make. Um, you know, there, there are definitely some duds that get tossed out, um, but they usually get tossed out in the collage process more than, more so than the, than the actual making process. And, you know, I think the sketch to collage really helps me work out any kinks that I might have um, with the drawing to try to keep it in the comp keep the composition and work out some colors. But yeah, the print itself might take me in between drying time could take me like two or three weeks to do a print. But I have a I also have I'm fortunate enough to have a drying rack, um, a large drying rack. So I can make, you know, I can be working on a couple of prints at a time. If you don't mind, I'd jump in again. Are you doing a lot of sketching while you're doing researching? You said you sounds like you have a long period of time where you're not printing, but you're thinking and reading. Are you drawing or coming up with ideas visually during that time? I am. So I, I'm doing more writing, but not like serious writing. So I'll be reading and I might highlight, but then something might stick out. Let's say like I'm, um, you know, uh, right now I'm doing work on colorism um, and reading and writing. And, and if I'm like Brown Society, I'm like, oh, Brown Society. And I just write that down in my notebook. You know, I want to research that later or, you know, blue veins, is, you know, blue veins, oh, I want to, or, you know, the connection to, I might jot something down really quickly. And then I might, you know, I might research it further, but I'm really jotting it down because I'm reading about it. And I'm curious to see where that might lead me in my, in my sketching. And then I'll do a word web um, from, from there. And then I'll make a ton of sketches. So one print might be the result of like, I've done 10 sketches and then I've combined three of them and then I erase some stuff. And then, you know, I, I ask somebody to model in different positions to see if it really works out if I do this or that. Um, and then I'll do another, another kind of sketch and then I'll do a collage. So, but my sketches are like, they're not professional. They're, <laughs> I do stick figure sketches. I'm really just trying to work out an idea and composition and symbols because I because I use a lot of symbolism in my work. It's really what I'm aiming to work out. So they're uh, you know I'm not trying to work out like somebody how you know the shape of somebody's face or you know, I'm not doing these large scale charcoal drawings. In spite of that, I still wouldn't mind seeing them to be honest with you. Oh really? Oh man, no, yeah, I wish yeah. I had my notebook down here, yeah. but I don't. They're truly unremarkable. They really are stick, stick figures. I'd be curious. Um, hi, if I can uh, uh, jump in with a question, this image that we're seeing right now, that element of the, of the show with the mirror figures, um, I wonder if you could talk more about that because each uh, each print, if I remember correctly, most of them just feature one person falling in the water. I think there might be one that has two, but there's something about the individual attention to, or the, the attention to each one. And then we see this element where just this, just a, a suggestion of the sheer numbers of, of, of people who fell in the water. And I think, can you talk more about that? I mean, well, on the one hand, the idea of this, um, this component, um, how does it interact with the prints? Because potentially at one point it seemed that, you know, the prints speak very eloquently about the, the, the middle passage, but then this element here adds another 
um, um, uh, some other some other implications and some other ideas that I can you know I I try to I come up with my own answers, but I want to hear what you have to you know what what you would you say about that 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 component of the of the piece? Yeah, sure. Um, so these mirrored pieces are meant so when I was conceptualizing this work, I was really thinking about you see all the prints and then you kind of wound up at this mirrored piece installation. The way that it was set up at LSU was that there were two walls, so they met a corner. Um, and so if you stood in front of it, you saw yourself front and side in these people. So, you know, you see people's humanity in the prints and then you see your own humanity in these people, you know, a way to garner empathy um, as well as, as well as tie, you know, tie it together that, that yes, this happened, but we're all people. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, that's the point of these. And, and also too, why like it's, you know, it's tall and tight, it's, it's multi-angled. Um, the mirrors are, are bronzed um, just to bring, you know, the, it's, it's the darkest color you can really get a mirror at. It just adds some solemnness. And it's also, you know, you could do black, but then it's, it's not as easy to see a reflection. And so I really wanted people to see themselves um, in these people. And that, um, that was the, the mirror installation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I had a particular question about like how, um, I, I, I noticed a lot about um, how you implement perception in your art. I was wondering how like you saw that, like, uh, like the figures or the images um, of like um, shapes of like bodily um, figures reflect perhaps a kind of uh, particular value of history or like a historical monologue or a hi historical timeline or something like that? Um, actually, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. I was wondering how you thought that the figures reflect like your value in history or like how much you implement and like how much pat like uh, historical references do you think you project into your uh, artistry? Uh, thank you. So most of all, I can't name a single piece series that I've done that I haven't injected history into the series. Um, I like, I really like connecting the past to the present. Um, I like, to draw that line for people. Um, I, you know, nothing new under the sun kind of feel. Also to, you know, this just, yeah, I like inserting history. And I really use a lot of symbolism to do that. So it's not like I'm gonna draw or I'm gonna create like a work that is um, pure, you know, just a pure reference to a point of time. You know, there, most of the work is, is narrative, using the symbols to carry that story um most of the work all the work is figurative it's all large it's all people a lot of the other works are people looking straight at you i think there's something about not look the person not looking at you that you know that that implies this vulnerability especially in this series um posture helps imply that as well um but yeah so i have a running list of things that I throw in prints, um, like my own allegory and my own, this, my own mythology um, that I just, that I, I, I recycle, but it's also, it's also, um, so, you know, for instance, um, for instance, the word, you know, watermelon, it's like supercharged. And it's only because how we, how, how you no, know, it's only because of, of what we're, we know why it's charged, but it's it's it sends a message right away without saying it. If you see a watermelon in a print, if you see a McDonald's symbol in a print, if you see um, a banana in a print, um, like you know, like like these a poppy in a print, um, which is a symbol of death. So it's I use symbolism a lot in in that way. And I don't really think that. For me, it's not, um, 
it's not taking away value or adding value to history. It's just, it's drawing a line between the past and the present. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that definitely answers my question. Uh, you just, I just, it just looked very creative. So I was just wondering like, um, like how you approach uh, creating art. Yeah. A lot of reading and then a lot of jotting and then a lot of sketching and then, yeah, by the time this happens, I'm like, it's gung ho. I'm like, this is what's happening. Let's do it. There's no futzing around in the studio. I'm not like, let me intuitively, you know, and that's great that, that uh, when people do that, it's just I, not my MO. I have a question about that actually, because you mentioned this like deep research period, um, but you also mentioned like learning about like this like history of the eels and these facts about eels in like a documentary that it sounds like you weren't necessarily watching for this kind of research. It was just like that connection sparked. So I wonder like how much space you do leave open for something to pop up that changes like the work you're currently doing. Oh, I'll, I, I leave lots of space for that. Um, I wouldn't say that I go out looking for it but I do leave space for it. I mean, I when you know, in points in points of research, you know, I'm doing the research because I don't because I don't know. So it's you know, there'll be little surprises here and there, and then I might go off down a rabbit hole down with some of them too. But um, but yeah, that was a that, and that really like watching that documentary. Um, they didn't talk about that eels were disgusting. It was just like this this like oh this what are we gonna do with these eels? Oh, I know. We're gonna ship them away, and then the conversation that happened between um, my husband, you know, after and during that, that it was like, oh, this is just how we perceive you. Okay, you know that that helped me to to draw a line and to really want to use eels in that way. Can I hop in and maybe ask a question that's in the chat, but also maybe add on to it a little bit. So Barbara is asking, um, she's noting, noting that the postures of the figure are really compelling, right? That they're active in, you know, um, in the sense that they are in the middle of a movement, but they've become static as they're entering into the water. Um, so Barbara's asking, um, when the figure comes into the process of registering the registrations that you make for the print. Um, and I'm also curious just to hear you kind of um, say a little bit more about the relationship between like the, the, the feeling of activity in the bodies. Like I'm thinking of the one image in particular of the woman with her hands over her head as she's going into the water, like she, yes, this woman. Um, so this kind of, you know, there's a kind of activity that's there. Um, versus that idea of fixed melancholy, right? That you're working against. Yeah, for sure. So, and to answer your first question in the registration process, I mean, it happens right away. I'm trying to see, let me see if I, let me grab a piece of wood. I happen to be in my windowless dungeon of a studio, so. This might help. Is this? Oh wait, I think I might. It's not registering, right? Because I'm blurred. Y'all no, are just gonna see my dang studio. Oh well. <laughs> I'm in this dungeon. Um, but like this print, for instance, um, you know, everything is drawn on it already. So, you know, I help myself by using colors to mark off where I don't want to carve first, where I do want to carve first. This is going to be printed on black paper. So I carved all the key line out. Um, and so it's, uh, it's with reduction print, it's like, it's not, um, it's only layers of color. 
it's not layers of um, figures. So everything is considered all at one time. You know, what color are you gonna print on top of another color? How opaque is this color versus how transparent is this color? Cause that matters. You don't print a yellow on top of a red. Um, you print a red on top of a yellow. Um, so yeah, you know, the, the registration is, oh, I didn't register this, this wood already, but it's just at the top. I draw a straight line. I make all my paper square. And then I put pencil marks on the back. It's super rudimentary, but it's really the only way that um, I can really register a large print. Um, most of the time, as I'm sure, you know, Melissa um, can can say and tell too, people build, build like um, almost like a little case for their, for their block and they register their paper to that. They either through pin registration or um, tab registration, um, which is great, especially Especially if you're doing multiple small, especially if you're doing like small um, blocks too. And let me see the second part of your of your question. Yeah, I mean, just just the you know the loss and the um, the vulnerability you know carried through this series from the next series is just in her and how they're all kind of falling. This one you happen to see her face; she's looking up as if like she's also lost something, like she's leaving something behind. Um, and maybe she is. Okay, I think I might blur my back. Oh, man, it's so depressing. I think it's really neat <laughs> to see your studio, a little bit of your studio. Um, so <clears throat> I and I'm I'm going to go ahead and jump in with one of my own questions. So um, one of the things um, I'm really attracted to in this work is um, the transition, right? You have the, the body that's half in and half out of water, you know, the, the part of the body that's in the air still is, is the vulnerable looking. You know, you can sense the humanity and the vulnerability and then they kind of descend into this like blue veil, you know, of water and then they start to transform. So do you use this idea of, of transformation or transition from one phase to another a lot in your work? I don't actually. Um, just those two, these two series, I did that with the anthropomorphic series. Um, but yeah, I don't normally have um, people transitioning. People are more, People are more like, and you know, satire narratives um, in a lot of my work. Um, but I know I said that, and then I showed you a wood block where a hand was transitioning to stairs. So maybe that is my new thing. But it's only in these three series that I've done that one. And I have a, a follow-up question for you too. Um, you talked, you really described um, your process well and how you get inspired by different things like language and, you know, just brainstorming and watching documentaries and reading. Um, are there any contemporary artists who also inspire your work? Um, I really, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that she, her, I really love Mangechi Mutu's work um, a lot. Um, I'm constantly surprised by artists though too that I see and I'm like, oh, who is this? You know, just going out and looking at art, it's like, well, what's that? This is happening, you know, without even, I feel like without even realizing it. But um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't look to art for inspiration, but I do find a lot of women's art very, or a lot of artists art, but particularly women artists are very inspirational. My process is a little different that I really am looking to words for inspiration. So, um, so you know, works by you know, Bell Hooks in general and Angela Davis and Dorothy Roberts and Irvin Kendi and Tiny She Coates. And, you know, they're really, that's really where I'm like, really looking. Yes, um, I can absolutely relate to that because I get inspired for images just by one word too, 
you know, I like to use my thesaurus. I've got a, a dusty old thesaurus that I, it, I look to for inspiration. <laughs> Just meanings of words, you know. So um, I saw another question in the chat that was sort of like sort of forward, like about the future. Do you have any um, any more plans for series that have I think it was like that have a historical context? Yeah. Are you planning another historical period for a future series? I am. So I'm working on a series right now about colorism in the black community um, for Prospect New Orleans. Um, and doing a lot of research about that. And I feel like that when I'm like, oh, you know, I've been asked to write about it recently. I'm like, do I have to? It's such a touchy subject. I feel like that more than like the other work that I've done is gonna is a bit touchy. But um, but I've done a little bit of research for that. Um, there's a really great book called The Accident of Color by, what's his name? Is it Daniel Brooks? Um, put out like last year. Um, that I read and there's there's a lot of articles about it that you know that you can research and just um in New Orleans especially you know Creole colorism being passed off as Creole and culture um and what that has meant for the black community black movements in New Orleans and doing work about that um, but I'm out of research phase really for that and I've made work for it already and I'm, I'm gonna make some more work for it. This, this block that I showed y'all is one of the works that I'm making for it. I, I have a question if I could interject now. We were talking about your work with my class the other day and I realized that you know as, as we were talking about it, there's this bill, I don't know if you've heard about it in Arkansas, where they wanna prevent the teaching of the 1619 project and so it was made me really happy to be, you know, standing in front of your work while this was happening. And then I thought, you know, in some quarters, this, this, your work might be really provoke a, some hostility by people, you know, sort of a negative uh, controversy. Has that ever happened in relation to your work? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And it's generally so. I think, um, you know, from my own experience it has been the expectation that, that I should create uh, uplifting pieces. So, you know, painting, project, you know, projecting black people in a, in a human light as human beings, just by being, just being human um, with no historical context, just I am. And I get that and I love that work, but it's not for, it's not everybody's mission. Um, but in general, that's the, you know, that's the critique and feedback that I get. Why did you use watermelon face? You know, why would you do that um, to us? And, you know, I get, you know, but, but yeah, of course, I think every artist probably experiences that. People who draw portraits are probably, they're probably experiencing that. Like, why do you just draw portraits? Um, but yeah, I get critique. I'm, I, I'm always really happy though, to to talk it out and hash it out. Like, I'm like, oh, wait, let's talk about it. You know, what makes you uncomfortable about this? Let, let, let's have some, some therapy. So, um, but yeah. Thanks. Katrina, I'd like to ask a question. I I think that was in the chat and then I'm also curious about, but kind of uh, the, the very specific installation um, for, uh, for this exhibition, how do you, um, how do you decide uh, what you want and how you want um, your work to look in different spaces? Um, let me just pull up the question to make sure I cover that too. How do you, how do you just, how do you decide to organize differently in different spaces? How do you want viewers to interact with it? So yeah, just a little bit uh, uh, about installation, if you would share that. I'm sure SketchUp is a, it's a really great program, um, you know, to, to do that, to plan for spaces and then to share with spaces so that they know um, what you want. Yeah. You know, for me, it's always like the height of the piece, like, and the spacing between, 
I think it's always, and I think you probably know that, Sarah, because I'm sure that I was that I was in writing when you got the work. <laughs> but I, the work is big and needs breathing room. There's a lot of, for, you know, for me, I feel like there's a lot of um, context to take in. There's a lot of like symbolism. There's a lot of a lot of things I want. It doesn't matter. I mean, it matters there in the space, but I don't want people to look around and just go, oh, you know, I want them to like be with a piece and then be with the next piece, be with the next piece. So, but yeah, SketchUp really helps. And then just advocating for yourself. If you're, if you don't want salon style hung work, you know, say that if you don't, if you want, if it's important that your frames are, that your work is framed in a certain way, uh, say that, you know, um, if it's important that your installation is hung in a certain way, but you can't be there for it, say that. Um, you know, exhibitions, I feel like in general, are, are spaces, you know, they work with artists pretty well. The ones that, the, the ones that, that don't are not going to work well in general for the rest of your exhibition. And you might want to reconsider whether or not you're going to show that, show there. But, um, but yeah, you know, sketch up. And if I can't pull, I'm not that savvy in it. So if I can't pull it together quick enough, um, I'll just draw a plan out, you know, I'll ask for the plans and I'll just, in Photoshop, I'll just put, 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 um, but, and then ask for, you know, the, when I, when I had a show at the Halsey, I did that and then they hung one work and then they hung another work and then took a picture and asked, you know, asked how I felt about it. They had, I had just hung two works. It wasn't, it wasn't very much skin off their back to take it down and rehang it if it wasn't the whole show. So, yeah. Yeah, advocate for yourself. Yeah. Tony or Melissa, do you guys have any other questions? We recruited you specially for this and I want to make sure that we take advantage of anything that you guys might be curious about or want to share from your experiences in seeing the exhibition. I don't think I have questions. I just want to say how much I, I really love this work. I so appreciate it. And I so appreciate having it um, here as an adjunct, you know, as I'm teaching kind of from the historical side. So I'm teaching from the sources that maybe inspired you, you know, it's just such a delight to be able to, um, you know, encourage my students to think through those historical sources with your thinking through of it um, and the way that you've represented them. I just think it's, it's such a powerful thing. So I really appreciate um, having the chance to get to be Get to be near this work. No, oh, thanks, Tony. Melissa, any final thoughts from you or questions for Katrina? Um, I would I would echo Tony and just thank you, Katrina, for for lending your work. It's it's a very powerful show, and it's it's been wonderful to hear you talk about it. You know, and then talk about a, some of your other bodies of work in relationship to it. Um, I think. You know, I think we're just really lucky to have you in our museum, um, and I've really enjoyed this chat with you. Oh, thanks, Melissa. Thank you, Tony and Melissa, for being with us this evening. And um, a comment from our uh, one of our our attendees in the chat um, is a great way for us to end. Not a question, but your work is beautiful. Thank you, Katrina, for sharing with us and. Um, so I'll thank you to Katrina. Thank you for sharing your work and thank you for sharing your time this evening. And um, it's, uh, it's great to hear from you directly and, and to see you in your space, in your studio. That's really, that's a treat too. Um, and thank all of you for, for joining us tonight and being with us. And I again, encourage you to uh, visit the website, wingatemuseum.org to keep up with everything that's happening at the museum and, um, and come visit us, check us out. There's good stuff happening. So with that, we'll close the program. And again, thanks everyone for being with us. And, and thank you, Tony and Melissa, and especially you, Katrina. Have a good night. Oh, thank y'all. Yes, thank you.